All right, this is Tanya Pearson interviewing Michelle Gonzalez on August 20th, 2016 in Livermore, I couldn't read my own writing, Livermore, California, <laughs> for the Women of Rock Oral History Project. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, so this is a like personal and professional okay. biography. Um, if you can talk a little bit about your childhood, family of origin, you were raised in a small town uh, mm -hmm. near the Bay Area by your single mother. Um, and you can read all this in your book, so I don't want to make you repeat anything okay. that you wrote about in Spit Boy, but just for the sake of okay. people who might not have read Great. it. Great. So my background. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I'm actually originally from L.A. My family is um, third generation Mexican-American. We're Chicanos from way, way back. My grandmother is from, my gran both my grandparents are from Mexico, or their grandparents, their parents are from Mexico. So my great-grandparents. And, but my grandmother was born in L.A., in Camarillo, California, in 1919. And her family, her parents came to the United States during the um, Mexican Revolution. And they had her about a year later after they got here to the United States. I think they got here in, like, 1918. So they had her in 1919. And um, so my family's from L.A. originally, um, well, since my grandmother. And we were all born and raised in L.A. When I was eight months old, we left my mom left my father in L.A. and left her whole entire family in the middle of the night because my father had threatened to um, kill her because she had left him. He, she, he was really abusive. And at work, she had met this guy. They became very friendly, and he really liked her, and he was like her knight in shining armor. And he, he knew that she was being abused, and um, she had left my father moved in with her father, and he, my father kidnapped me, and it was at this point where he said that he was going to kill her if she didn't come back to him or at least bring his daughter. So this man, who is my brother's father, um, Bob, said, um, let's just get out of here. We'll go to the Bay Area. My grandmother lives there, and um, we'll just get you out of here because um, this guy's crazy. Now my mom just really felt like she didn't have a choice, so she left with this guy, and um, who she was starting this relationship with and left in the middle of the night and didn't tell anyone in, in her family where she was going until for six months she didn't call anyone in her family because she was too afraid that my father would find her and kill her or take me and he had already tried so um, he was serious so after living in the Bay Area for a couple of years when my brother was around one or two um, she had, the, my mom had this pastoral fantasy and she wanted to live in the country. You know, she was born in East LA. She's from Boyle Heights and um, lived in an urban setting her whole life and just wanted to raise her kids in the country. She also knew that she was about to be single. Things were not working out, had not worked out with Bob. They were young. You know, they got together very quickly. And um, he had some friends that lived in Tuolumne and he took us there to see it and she really liked it. So she realized, you know, I could probably afford I'm gonna have to go on welfare I'm probably I can probably afford to live here with my kids and send them to a safe school at least they can walk to school and maybe I can you know just find my way here in a smaller you know a small town and be able to support them and um, she actually on welfare within 12 years was able to um, buy her own house it's not a nice house it's um I always like to say a couple steps steps up from a, like a shack I mean when we moved into it it had garbage in it we had like to clean all this people just came there and like like squatted it seemed like and threw a bunch of garbage in. there was lots of piles of garbage in the backyard um so i grew up in tuolumne that's the town that um we moved to um tuolumne is in california it's actually just east of here um it's about two and a half hours from here maybe two from from livermore where we are and um it's a very small town when i was growing up there there were only 700 people and there are not very many people of color. It's changed, of course, um, but when I was growing up there, there were only a few Mexican families in town. And um, most of them were working class, and they, um, one, well, there was one woman who was single, and there were a couple families. Um, we, Tuolumne in the 80s, it's, Tuolumne still is a very conservative area. Um, it's weird. It's only like two, two and a half hours from where I live in Oakland, but it's really definitely a kind of a different part of California. And so I grew up in the environment in the 80s when people of color were not welcome in Tuolumne. And the irony, I wrote this in my first, the first memoir that I wrote that's still unpublished, that um, when Tuolumne was formed, it was formed because um, there were a lot of 
um, gold mines there. And they welcomed a bunch of Chinese and Mexicans to come and work on the mines, and they especially welcomed people from Sonora, Mexico, where there are a lot of mines, to help them come and do the mining work and teach them how to do it. But as soon as the townships were formed, they kicked all the Mexicans out. <laughs> so, this, so this is the county that I grew up in. Um, it wasn't welcoming to me. and my, my, I had a Mexican-American friend in high school. We started our first band, Bitch Fight. And uh, we got bullied a lot in school. Um, part of it was class stuff because um, we were poor and we were on welfare. But a lot of it was race, too. Um, and so at a very early age, we got into punk rock because we were just, like, angry and, like, it just seemed right um, for us to... Um, and we had a lot to rebel against. We had a lot to be angry about. And I don't know, a town like that when we got bullied um, and having the kind of tough single moms that we had, just we could, became political very, very early on. Um, Can I go back a little yes, bit? Yes, please. Okay. I know. I was um, like, what else did she ask me? Oh, no, no, it's okay. <laughs> um, well, I kind of wanted to know what kind of kid you were before you found punk rock because in your book you talk about you started playing flute, mm -hmm. and you were in the school band, and, like, what was the, when did, like, that change happen when you got politicized, yeah. or, but what kind of kid were you, like, bef before that, in school, before you found punk? I was a pretty scrappy little kid. I liked to ride my bike and um, fix it if it broke down, or um, one of my favorite activities was chopping wood. Like I hated having to wash the dishes, which I totally did. My mom was like, we don't need a dishwasher. You're my dishwasher. <sighs> I, I hated the indoor chores. Um, I mean, no one likes to sweep the floor or do dishes, but, um, I did love chopping wood. So I had a real, I was always a very physical person. Um, and so learning to play drums was something that like, I started off trying to be the guitar player of the band. Cause I thought, you know, I should be a front person, right? With this personality, I should be a front person. But I um, I think I was a kind of kid that stuck out in class because I was polite, but I was probably kind of charismatic, and I was sweet to adults. Um, but I was very um, physical and chatty. I always got in trouble for talking in class, always. One of my teachers put tape over my mouth once. Yeah, which is illegal. Um <laughs> And when I took it off, my lips were chapped, my lips were all bloody, and of course I made a big stink in the, in the middle of the class just to scare her, like I was going to get her in trouble, because, you know, I was sassy. I was a sassy sixth grader. Um, so from third, I started playing the flute in the third grade, and um, I thought the flute was really cool. It was a good instrument for a girl. That was my... Um, original thought and reason why I wanted to play it. I also live far, um, well, not super far from home, but probably about probably about a mile from the school. And um, it was good that I didn't like play trombone or tuba or anything like that, because it would have been, it's, it was a lot easier to carry a flute in a little case. I was a very creative child, obviously. I, um, I wasn't like into drawing or anything like that. I mean, I probably tried to dry horse, draw horses, but I failed at that because I was not a good artist. But um, I just took to music. My grandfather was a jazz musician. Um, he played keyboards and percussion, and he played, like, weddings and um, probably, probably, like, baptisms and stuff like that. Uh, my mom um, would... When she was young, she would actually carry his equipment. So she always told stories about Grandpa Al being at Alfonso, was his real name, Grandpa Al taking her to um, play these parties and stuff. And um, he and I, he was really close to our family, and so he was a big influence on me. Um, and so in 19, I don't remember what year the Go-Go's put out, Beauty and the Beat, I think it was 1982 or something like that. Um, we heard that record after being in, you know, school band, for many years, we heard the Go-Go's and we're like, oh my God, Nicole Lopez and I were like, we are going to be in a band like the Go-Go's. That was our mission. And then we heard The Clash and we realized that we wanted to be in a band. We were, you know, after the Go-Go's, The Clash record came out, I think right after it, maybe within a year. And um, within that year, we were getting more bullied and getting a little older, moving into puberty. And um, you have that teenage angst, right? Yeah. And um, we heard The Clash. We thought, man, if we could put those two things together, the female band, I never wanted to be in a band with guys, a female band and the political 
you know, conscious message, message like The Clash. I felt like that would be like the perfect band. Um, and because we were women, we naturally just wrote about women's issues even early on in the first band, Bitch Fight. Mm-hmm. Um, was it from like personal experiences or you said the Go-Go's were a big influence, but did you have any other uh, female fronted bands or punk bands or were you really just kind of like making it up as you went mm-hmm. along? In Tuolumne, we um, did not have access to records or cool music or, you know, you could go to Value Giant. That was the name of the store in town, Value Giant, and buy records. But the only, the only edgy thing that you could get that was modern at that time was like the Go-Go's. So we didn't really have access until we got a little older to other punk bands. Um when we were about 15 or 16, we saw, of course, the decline of Western civilization. Um, and Alice Bag was in that. And frankly, I saw that movie and it freaked me out. Yeah. The movie is really scary. And Alice doesn't have an interview in it, which is interesting. If she had been interviewed in it, I think I would have been, I would have been less scared yeah. because she's so smart and articulate and she wouldn't have come off like some of the other people who were interviewed did. And um, I remember seeing Alice's image on the screen and just feeling like, whoa, this whole thing is really intense. And I recognized that she looked like me. We both had short, my hair was very similar to hers in that video at the time. And feeling kind of afraid in this, not afraid of her, but just afraid, like, this is where it could go. Mm -hmm. Or... I could be seen that way, or is this really what I want to be? And that part of the problem is the the depiction of punks in that movie. So that was not an that was an odd negative influence for me. Um, but we didn't have access. We started going to Berkeley to show to Berkeley and San Francisco to go to shows later in our teens, like maybe one more when we were like fifteen years old. And um, and we would go to like Rasputin's and just look for records um, and music that we wanted to listen to, and there, we didn't because when we'd go to the Bay Area, it was within it was just a few hours at a time. We'd drive down two three hours and come back the same day often because we didn't have money to spend the night there and we didn't know anybody, so we couldn't get a motel room, so we had to do it really on the cheap. So you had an hour in Rasputin's and you had you know an hour to have dinner and you walk around on Telegraph Avenue and then you go to a punk show and then you drive home. So um, we would just buy the records from the bands that we heard of, you know, MDC, you know, the starter punk bands, Black Flag, um, and more Clash records because we always love the Clash. (laughs) Was your mom supportive of your newfound love of punk? And (laughs) at some some point in your book, you said that you like shaved your head and started kind of dressing Mm -hmm. more punk and being more outspoken. Um, how did she react to this change in you? Well, at first she kind of freaked out. And I think it freaked her out in the same way that I was freaked out by Alice. God, I've never told her that. By Alice, <laughs> in, I've meant to, by her in the, the decline of Western civilization. And that was that Alice represented like just, or she was doing this thing that was so opposite and anti a traditional Mexican-American woman or a traditional Latina. And the main thing for my mom was the short hair. Like Mexican girls, a beauty standard for Mexican girls is long hair. So it really was really difficult for my mom when I cut her, cut my hair. She wanted me to keep my hair long forever. And um, she went through a phase of being a little angry with me. Um, and it would come out in that sort of like, um, passive aggressive mom way yeah. um, where she would just kind of get angry um, at me irrationally. I come back from Berkeley and she would just be really mad. Be like, you have to wash the dishes, you have to do the laundry and like just like come down and make me do all the chores, come down really hard on me and make me do all the chores. Um, and I think it was a combination of, I don't really think it was so much the look as the the realization that I was separating from her. Um, And maybe in some ways she thought I was separating from or rebelling against my ethnic identity, my my being a Chicana. But but I wasn't necessarily. Um, 
more so of just rebelling against just kind of like everybody and everything. Mm-hmm. And we didn't have a, I didn't really have a super strong sense of my Chicanisma in Tuolumne because there's no Latino community there. There's, we didn't speak Spanish in the home. And um, so I didn't really feel like I was giving up or rebelling against that so much as just what it means to be a girl. And, the ex- you know, I wanted to play drums. And, um, you know, the only woman that anyone knew who played drums back then was Sheila E. So in high school, when I started playing drums, I'd be practicing in the in the band room because the the music teacher let me practice the drums because he knew I wanted to learn after school in the band room when there was no um, practice. And um, people would call me like Sheila E. and stuff. So I'm like, yeah, I've heard that one before. Very original. Very original. And you taught your yourself, your totally self-taught drummer. We talked a little bit about reading music. Uh-huh. Um, um, yeah, so I um, learned how to play the flute and read um, treble clef um, okay or pretty well in in elementary school and high school. But um, I'm mostly a self-taught drummer. I took a, this music accre- appreciation class in high school, and um, the teacher wanted to use the class mainly for people who were already musicians to teach themselves or teach each other or learn a new instrument. I think he was supposed to give a lecture on music appreciation, but he never did that. Um, we would just go in there and mess around and play different instruments. And um, I had a crush on a Miwok Indian, and there's a Miwok tribe in Tuolumne, and I had a crush on Kevin Bernito, and he was the most handsome guy, um, dark skin, really long, beautiful fingers, and you know, creamy brown skin, um, and funny and charming and charismatic. And um, I always wanted his attention, and he played the drums and the bass guitar in the in the jazz band. And so, Kevin um, or Mister Mister Wells, the teacher said, "Um, Kevin, why don't you show her a couple of things on the drums, and just to, to get her started?" So he just showed me a couple of things, um, and then I just started practicing on my own. Mo- not even really so much in the music appreciation class. I mostly just talked to my friends in that class, but I would <laughs> practice at home. My mom bought me drums finally. Oh, your mom bought you a drum set. Well. It was funny because I asked for a guitar and an amp one year, and I got it, and I was really excited. But then I tried to take guitar lessons, and I was terrible at guitar. And um, I wasn't learning fast enough. And our, our Nicole wanted to play bass guitar. And she already knew how to play guitar okay, or was learning. And we finally realized, maybe you should play guitar for now until we get a guitar player so we can start writing some songs, and I will play drums. I just had this thought, I should play drums. I don't know why. I was like, I should play drums. And then I went to that music, we went to that music appreciation class for the year. And I started learning. And I, within a couple of months of, of deciding I was going to play drums, we were a band and we were writing songs. Okay, and, and this is Bitch Fight? And this is started- Bitch Fight. In, in, oh, gosh, I was 15. Yeah. So 1985, maybe even 1984 we started. But I think Bitch Fight really took off in 1985. And yeah, I had to ask my mom after, you know, my mom was, did not have a lot of money. We were on welfare. And um, I had to then go back to her and say, I, now I want a drum set. Yeah, I know. I remember this from the book now. <laughs> now I need you to buy me a drum I felt really bad about it. And um, she did. She was selling some pots. So um, she oh, was. Oh, that's what she did. She was selling some pot and some other things, so she was able to scrape together the funds and buy me a drum set, so I didn't have to feel that bad, you know, Mm -hmm. drug money. Yeah. Um, Did you have a job or anything when you were that young? Junior, sophomore year, I had a summer, I had summer jobs, so they had this mother load, we live in the mother load country, and um, mother load, like youth job program. I did that for two summers, and I worked as a um, like an assistant in a summer camp one summer. Mainly, I just made out with this cute skateboarding guy um, <sighs> during my breaks. <laughs> he lived down the street, and he was doing skateboard tricks, and I was like, oh, my God, he's so cute. And before you know it, yeah, I was like, you know, once the kids would take a nap, and I had like a little break, I'd go like and make out with him, and then I'd come back. Okay, I'm ready to take care of the kids now. Um <laughs> And then the following summer, I got an, another job. Can you believe they rehired me um, as a preschool teacher's aide in an um, actual preschool? And then I did that job again the following summer, and a little, I think, a few, a couple hours a week during the school year once I was driving. Oh. Um, and then when I came to the Bay Area, I started working as a preschool teacher's aide yeah. also. Mm-hmm. And were you a pretty good student in high school, or? Um, 
I was what they would have considered average. Okay. I did really well in English. I was terrible at math, and I wasn't so great at science. Um, any of the STEM stuff, I was pretty bad at. The music and the English and the history, I was very good at. Um, sometimes I, I, I would usually get A's or B's in English, and um, I would always fail math. So I was, I was what they considered average. I, my counselor did not encourage me to go to college. Oh, okay. I told them that I wanted to go to community college. I took the SATs, the pre-SATs, um, which I think were free, but the SATs were going to cost money. And I was like, well, I'm just going to go to a community college anyways. Um, so I don't need to take the SATs because I'm not going to pay for that. Um, but it, I really didn't want to take the SATs after I got in the minus percentile in math. That's how bad in math yeah. I was. Same. Yeah, so um, I definitely am like a one side of the brain kind of person. Yeah. So in, in school, I was probably just considered average when, when, you, when you factor in the bad grades and then the good grades. You know, it kind of comes out in the middle, right? Um, but I, I liked school a lot. Um, the bullying never, you know, never really ceased, even in high school. Even when you were in bitch fight and you had... Yeah. That didn't give you any, like, social capital and... No, they... <laughs> cool no, the jocks still threw oh, okay. cartons of milk at our head and tater tots and oh. nachos. Yeah, we couldn't even go into the cafeteria or else they would just throw food at us. Any of the punk kids or the... All the punks and the nerds and the geeks just hung out together. Um, But I liked school because... It was organized and it was safe for the most part. And um, my house was just chaotic. You know, my mom, who, you know, I, as I said earlier, was dealing drugs, became pretty ad addicted to drugs okay. in my teens. And you just, I just didn't want to be home very often because it was just no fun. It was dirty and she was, you know, very irrational and unpredictable. Sometimes she would stay up for nights on end on meth and just be sewing. And then she'd sleep for three days. And I was the oldest, so I had to, you know, yeah. make sure my brother and sister got off to school. Um, so school was like a relief in some ways because I would go to band, you know, marching band and play music and see my friends. And the teachers thought I was charming enough um, and likable enough to um, give me, you know, feedback on things that I did well, um, you know, like read the part of Juliet. My, my English teacher said I actually was the only person who sounded like I knew what Juliet was talking about. I didn't really know. I, just, yeah. I was just a good reader. I just faked it very well. But. Um, and, okay, so you were in Bitch Fight. You moved to San Francisco mm -hmm. after you graduated. Um, mm -hmm. You decided not to go to college and to just... Do music? Like, were you kind of sort of dead set on doing something with the band? Sort of. So all of Bitch Fight actually um, registered for community college and got financial aid. Okay. I cried the first time I filled out the FAFSA because it was so hard and daunting and like, you know, government forms. Oh, my God. Um, no one in my family. See, I'm the only person in my family who's graduated from high school or even went to college. Both of my parents. Um, my mom was kicked out of high school when she got pregnant with me and my dad dropped out. Um, so anything that's like a bureaucratic system is very difficult for young people who haven't had to navigate that. You know, I see that in my work as a community college instructor. Um, but we, bitch fight, we did want to go to school. We, we wanted to be smart. We wanted to learn stuff. We were young women who were kind of ambitious for people coming out of Tuolumne, you know? So we got into, we, well, Anyone gets into the community college, which is why I like it. Um, open access. We got into. Um, we went to City College of San Francisco, and we got financial aid. And we went for like a month or a month and a half. And I just kept getting lost on campus. I didn't know how to read my schedule. I would show up to the wrong classroom. And we just. It was just too overwhelming. And I was seventeen. We left Tuolumne in Jan in June. Two weeks after I graduated, I was still 17. I didn't turn 18 until October. Mm -hmm. I just don't think I was mature enough or ready, and I didn't have enough um, family historical knowledge for college that 
and that I needed to to be ready and to be mature enough to to navigate that system. So within a month and a half, we had all dropped out and um, we were practicing. We'd found another, we found someone to play bass, so Nicole could play guitar. And we were partying a lot. Mainly we were just drinking a lot of beer. Um, we didn't, Susie liked to smoke a lot of pot, but Nicole and I didn't. We just liked to drink and hang out with our friends, go to shows um, and try to meet cute boys. And, um, you know, we were like, oh, school's just in the way. And, you know, I mean, and, you know, that was like our thing. We're like, oh, we don't want to go to school yet. We're just not, you know, we're just, we just want to play music. For me, I was just too afraid. Yeah. I just wasn't ready. Yeah, and I'm glad I waited. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, my God. I was going to ask something else that I didn't write down. Now I forgot. Um, you said that you learned a lot playing in Bitch Fight, mm-hmm. the first band. And that, I mean, eventually... How long did that last before you started playing in Spitboy or formed Spitboy with Adrian? Um, in 1987 was when Bitch Fight moved to San Francisco, and we were together for about a year, year and a half in the Bay Area. Oh, okay. That's longer than I thought. Did you? Well, this is what I was going to ask. Uh-huh. Did you guys play a lot of shows? Have you, like, made a name for yourself down we there? We did. Like, known as like, yeah. a good drummer? I don't, I don't think I was known as a good drummer, but if you were a girl an all-girl band playing music in the punk scene back then, you you would get some attention. And okay. you would probably get a show mainly because people were curious. It's sort of a spectacle sort of thing. <laughs> um, but we became friends with Operation Ivy and Crimp Shrine and MDC, and we, we played shows with them. A lot of those shows were at Gilman. We played in the park across from the police station in Berkeley with MDC. Um... And we were dating some of the, we began dating some of the people in the scene. I was seeing Aaron Elliott from Crimp Shrine, the drummer, at that time. And um, so we made friends and people thought we were interesting and they thought we had a cool story. You know, we're all females playing punk music from this weird town that nobody had ever heard of. Um, so we did play for quite a while. I mean, it was about a year, year and a half probably a year in total playing because the first few months we were just here trying to like find our way, meet people and stuff. Um, and then Spit Boy formed in 1990. So okay. it the weird thing is, is that at the time it felt like I wasn't in a band for like years and years and years. But what, that's only like a year or yeah. two? <laughs> <laughs> I did play guitar and come on the carnivores in the interim. Um, but yeah, I learned a lot in Spit Boy. I learned a lot about, I mean, in, in I learned a lot in Bitch Fight. Um, And a lot of what I learned was how to be in a band and not let your ego get in the way of the art. Um, Bitch Fight was called Bitch Fight because we fought all the time. We couldn't manage to get along. It was difficult because the main people in Bitch Fight from the beginning were just three of us. Mm -hmm. And um, Susie was the oldest, but Nicole was sort of the alpha in the band, and we all wanted Nicole's attention. And so Nicole and I both lived in Tuolumne, and Susie lived in Columbia down the street, down the hill. Susie and I were friends from fourth, since we were four and five years old. Um, so Susie and I had our relationship, and I had my relationship with Nicole from going to elementary school with her. We were in the same grade. But somehow we, Susie and I just sort of like competed for Nicole's attention. So one of the things I learned was um, to avoid that, that triad trouble that you can get into when there's just a, a a group of friends when there's just three people and find ways to not um, allow that to intrude on your relationships and on and on your art um i learned a lot about Im- the importance of just you know open communication and really talking out the vision of the band um i also learned that i lost some really I, that i lost some really important friends when we broke up um some friends who really knew me and where i was from and my ethnic background and my class background um those were the last people in the Bay Area um, who knew anything about me from the time before I left Tuolumne. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was really sad. Um, I think I went through a real depressive period um, when the band broke up. Um, and then later I realized, gosh, you know, that was cool to be in a band where we all had similar backgrounds because that wasn't the case for Spit Boy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in the book you talk a lot about feeling like a, a fish out of water after that breakup and the kind of interim period before 
Spitboy, were you able to pinpoint at that time that it was um, that it was like a class and race thing, or did you just think that you were depressed and you couldn't really figure it out? Mm, I don't think I was mature enough to pinpoint that it was race and class, to be honest. I may, Maybe I would have said... I probably wouldn't have said this because I wouldn't have wanted anyone to admit it or to admit it to anybody. But I, maybe I would have thought, like, I feel like a country bumpkin. Mm-hmm. And I have to try to figure out how to be in the Bay Area, how to be me in the Bay Area. Um, which was confusing because, you know, people, um, well, it was largely in the punk scene, colorblind. But some early stages of multiculturalism were, were beginning to happen. And so outside of the punk scene people would um, be curious or interested in my background and my identity and I, I just felt like I don't don't do I even have one I grew up in this I'm like this Chicana who grew up in this small town I, I'm just I don't really know yeah. and I don't I don't know how to express that um who I am or you know how do I can I claim can I claim and I didn't really feel like I could claim I had any right to claim being Mexican-American because I didn't speak Spanish, and I didn't grow up in L.A., and uh, my mom did, and, you know, I had chola cousins and everything. I knew all that, but I didn't really, like, talk about it. I didn't know if, if I could claim it or if if, if um if anyone would believe me. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> or if it mattered, or if they cared. Yeah. So. Um, okay, well, before I ask this question, um, can you just talk about how you met your bandmates and Spitboy and kind mm-hmm. of, like, you know, what the what it was like in the beginning, making mm-hmm. a name for yourselves mm-hmm. and what the scene was like at the time. I met Paula first. We were both preschool teachers at the time and, and we didn't meet through work, but we met in the scene and then we realized we were both preschool teachers and so, you know and we had that in common, you know, it was cool that to talk be able to talk with somebody in the scene that was something that was more than just like punk rock bands or boys in bands or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um and I told Paula, and for, you know, for all those millions of years in between Bitch Fight and yeah. <laughs> Spit Boy, it felt like so long. I was dying to play drums in a band again and to form another female band. And um, anyone I met who I liked even a little, I would ask, do you play an instrument? You know, to try to find out. Or do you want to learn to play an instrument to find out if, they could, if I could, maybe they'd be somebody I could be in a band with? Um, and Paula told me that she was trying to learn how to play bass at the time. And I thought that was really cool. Her boyfriend, like, played drums already. So um, she was, like, trying to mess around with the bass guitar. And I said, well, keep practicing. You know, let's start a band. Let's meet some people and start a band, okay? I want to be in a ba- another band with all women. And um, I don't know if she thought I was serious or not, but I was so serious. I, was, I remember that feeling. I was like, I am going to start another band. And this band is going to last. And this band is going to make an impression. So she told me about... Karen, who um, Karen Gembis, our guitar player, who was um, work, doing some work for Maximum Rock and Roll. Apparently, I guess the story is that Karen took guitar lessons when she was young, and some of the guys in like Cringer and some of the other bands in San Francisco were teaching her how to play bar chords. And Paula said, "I think Karen is learning how to play, you know, play bar chords. Um, I'm going to talk to her and find out." And then in the interim, I I heard Adrian singing on this tape that she somehow gave to the guy I was dating at the time. <laughs> And I don't know how he wound up with it, but Adrian's ex was the guitar player of Christ on Parade. And his name was Doug. And that was a very big political band at the time. Really big, super political, kind of like a precursor to like neurosis and stuff. And um, at the time, you know, we sort of thought of her as Doug's girlfriend. Um, I said to Neil, I want to meet Doug's girlfriend. I love her voice. She's got to be in my band. And he's like, all right, I'll invite them over. So he invited them over. And it turns out she does this p- super political feminist fanzine. I'm like, oh, this is, this is the woman for me. I felt, like, I felt like I had to like do whatever I had to do to get her in my band. I just knew it. She's got to be in my band. And the funny thing is this, the voice that was singing on the tape is not ultimately the Adrian Spitboy voice. But um, I knew she could sing, and she sounded great doing it. Um, and then I found out that she wrote that fancy and I thought she's totally the person that I want to be in a band with. It's she'll, she'll be perfect. And um, so we practiced. We got Karen together, 
Paula got Karen over, and we borrowed someone's practice space in West o- in East Oakland down by Laney College. And um, I don't even remember whose practice space it was at the time, but they let us practice in there, and I think I used their drums. And I wrote the song seriously. It was our, our first song. It was about being sexually harassed at a party and um, by some guys in a punk band, incidentally. And um, I wrote it on acoustic guitar. It was like probably three or four chords. Real simple. Um, you know, kind of like tough chick lyrics. And um, I thought, well, we got to have something to do. I don't want to just be standing around being like, well, what are we going to do? Like, I'll bring this song and we can at least play this and then see how it feels. By the end of the practice, we were, we just knew. It just clicked. The energy in the room was just like so electric and we just knew we were a band. Then in the practice, we're like, okay, when are we going to practice next? We're, we're, we got to find a practice space. What days should we practice? That was it. After that, we started practicing two days a week. And um, Karen would bard over from, from San Francisco because practice spaces were cheaper over here. She would bard over from San Francisco with her guitar. And um, she kept her amp in the practice space. And we um, would just practice twice a week. For as far as making a name for ourselves in the Bay Area, um, you know, we were friends with all the right scenesters at the time. You know, Econo Christ. Um, Neurosis, the bands that were playing in the Bay Area then um, that, that formed here. Um, we were friends with all of them just from being a part of the scene. And um, in some ways, people saw me as um, already a part of the scene in in not just a peripheral way because I had been in other bands and I had done records on Lookout Records. And so I, I got a little bit of cachet, I think, from that. So... Um, And then people knew Karen from Maximum Rock and Roll, and Paula volunteered at Blacklist and at Maximum Rock and Roll, and Adrian was doing the zine. So once you put that group of people together, people were going to be interested in what we were doing um, and how that would sound and what it would look like. And at our first show, we played at the 61st Street Warehouse where members of Paxton Quigley lived. They formed a little after we did. Um, I, th- I actually, honestly, of course, Neil is going to kill me for saying this because he's the ex-boyfriend I mentioned earlier. I actually think Paxton Quigley formed after they saw Spitboy and saw what we can do. Like, oh, yeah. oh, we got to form a band now. Um, <laughs> I'll take the credit it's for that. Record. It's on record. <laughs> um, but we played at the 61st Street Warehouse, and I remember all the like total scenesters came out to see us play. I don't remember who we played with. We might have played with somebody who was a draw, too. That might have been one of the other reasons why yeah. they were there. But I do remember feeling this distinct feeling that I had that people showed up. There was it was a pretty big crowd for a first show because they were just curious. They wanted to see if we can pull it off. And it was like a spectacle. They wanted to see if these women can pull off playing hardcore. It wasn't gonna they knew it wasn't gonna be melodic. Um, you know, the word was on the street that it wasn't a melodic outfit, it wasn't sing along harmonies, it was gonna be hardcore. And people, I think people wanted to know if we could really do it. And um, we, people, when I think when we were playing, I could, I, I, I remember I, I wanted the male approval, which is so stupid, but you know, I, I wanted the approval of my people in my scene and they were mostly male, right? Yeah. It's unfortunate that I was seeking male approval, but it was more than that. It was more I wanted my peer approval. And um, people were nodding their heads and, oh yeah, okay. I didn't feel like anyone was like bowled away. And eventually I did wind up getting the feeling like what we were doing, they thought was cool and they thought it was important, but they weren't gonna go out and see us every night, every time we played because it was too much of a challenge or it was gonna be too like, you know, you know, we were singing songs that made a lot of men uncomfortable yeah, um, because it challenged who they were and their position in the world. Um, so I always sort of felt that way. I haven't talked about this at all, and I've thought about it, and I wanted to talk about it, um, and I always forget, and that is I re- distinctly remember that we used to hang up our own flyers. So when we'd play, we really wanted to get the word out that we were playing, um, especially that first show that we played at Gilman, and we wheat-pasted our flyers. We had, like, wheat paste, and we had our flyers, and we marched up and down, like, Hate Street, and I just put up as many flyers. I remember a few nights where Adrian and I would just be tromping around up and down Hate Street or or Ashby or, you know, um, Shattuck and just hanging up as many flyers as we could afford to print out to get people to come out to our shows. Um, 
So we worked really hard to um, get people interested. Mm -hmm. um, and this is just, okay, it's a little bit earlier. It sounds like you're more extroverted than yeah. I thought you were when I oh, read your book. Uh -huh. Because in your book, you describe yourself as sort of <laughs> aloof and guarded and the hothead of the band. Yeah. Um, why do you think you developed that kind of personality or reputation mm -hmm. in, in Spit Boy? Well, I think I was a, a much more guarded when I was younger because of all the bullying in high school. Okay. I've thought about this a lot, and I think it has a lot to do with it. You know, I grew up in a small town, and I was bullied an awful lot. And um, I, and it, a lot of it was class, and a lot of it was about race. And I grew a very large chip on my shoulder. And so I also learned um, from that experience, it, it made me not want to trust people. Um, or just to be guarded. I just sort of assumed that people were going to be mean to me. So I was just going to have to toughen up. I grew a very thick skin. Um, I was always very outgoing and extroverted. Um, but in Spit Boy, I was the least friendly. Yeah. They went around smiling a lot. Um, Adrian, Karen is known for having a really beautiful, really infectious smile. And so is Adrian. Um... And they also have straight teeth and had braces when they were growing up, which is also a class thing. <laughs> I had a chip on my shoulder, was always more guarded, and, you know, I didn't have braces. So I, for many years when I was younger, I, I did do that thing where I didn't yeah. want to smile because I was, I had, my teeth were just worse. They stuck out a lot worse than they did. So um, interestingly, that is sort of a class thing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, so those things definitely made me more um, just like guarded or protected um, and a little more standoffish. I wouldn't say I wasn't shy and I wasn't introverted. I was just more guarded. Okay. Yeah. And uh, what was your relationship like with all with your bandmates? Like you were all pretty much friends, right? And made decisions together. Yes. We all got along really, really well. Adrian and I lived together for a few years at one point. Um, and we were all really good friends. Karen and I hung out a lot. I would go to the city, and I would stay with her in her apartment, and we'd go to yoga classes together, or walk around, or go eat good burritos, um, or go to shows together. Um, when Paula was in the band, Paula and I were, were the earliest friends, and we had teaching in common. And um, I always felt very safe with Paula, always. Um, I don't know why. She's just very, Paula was always very savvy about class issues. Mm -hmm. So I just felt really safe with her. Like she, she didn't really knew, know where I came from, but she definitely like um, never, I knew that she would never make me feel weird about it. Yeah. Yeah. So we were all really good friends and we, we really genuinely loved each other and were inspired by one another. And um, we, when we were riding in the van, we would sing along to the same. We'd listen to Liz Fair constantly. We'd all sing along together. We'd talk constantly about everything under the sun. We would sit around at band practice, and we would discuss our vision for the covers of records or how we wanted this certain song to go or what our approach was going to be for heckling. And the communication was really good. And that was one of the people that commented, uh, one of the things that people commented about when they met us. They said, you guys are so nice and you get along so well like it was really rare for a touring punk band when you're in your 20s yeah it's difficult to be in close quarters with anybody so touring punk bands in their 20s notoriously there was a lot of strife and fighting and weird dynamics within the band and we i remember working very hard not because I loved them so much and respected them so much to not let little things annoy me. Mm -hmm. Like there were little things like Paula was moody sometimes and Karen was very good at getting her own needs met. And Adrian was so chatty and friendly with fans that she would never help me carry my drums, even though that was her <laughs> job. <laughs> she would just forget. And I know it was innocent, but I remember I would sometimes get annoyed by these things, and I and I remember telling myself I, I love them too much and respect them too much to let these little things 
get get in the way of our relationships. Like, I'm just going to have to let those things go. And I also knew, you know, unconsciously um, that I probably did a lot of things that were really annoying too. There's actually an interview that I, that I, that you can find online. Um, we're on tour. It's like 1992 and we're being interviewed and I say something and Paula and Karen say something. They're kind of making fun of me. Mm-hmm. And I saw that a, a couple of years ago. I was like, Oh my, I was really taken aback. I was like, Oh my, it made me feel really sad. It made me feel really bad. But it was probably one of those times in the van when we're all just like, so getting on each other's nerves. Yeah. And I was probably doing some weird, annoying thing that, 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 that they couldn't, put aside at the moment. Um, but those those were really rare occurrences. It wasn't until the very end of the band that we, we were getting a little older. We did start to grow apart. And I think that's very natural when you start, when you get together in a band with people when you're in your tw- early 20s, 20 or something, and and you go five, six years, everybody starts to change and, and grow a little bit. And um, inevitably, there are going to be some kinds of uh, um, changes that maybe you won't weather as well. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, I don't know if I'm jumping to this before, because I have some questions about, like, the labels that you were on in touring, but there are a couple of chapters in your book referring to Riot Girl. Um, the first, when you offended the entire movement <laughs> by right. insisting that you were not a Riot Girl band. not a Riot Girl band. Um, and the second time was when a white Riot Girl accused Spitboy of cultural appropriation um, because they have this person objected to your use of Spanish on your record. Yes. Um, so can you talk about your feelings about the Riot Girl movement, maybe like then versus now? I know mm-hmm. you said that you were just interviewed for like yeah. a Riot Girl documentary. Yeah. I, I was the opposition, not not so much the opposition, but I was a counterpoint. I think okay. I was used as a counterpoint or interviewed um, for the purpose of being a counterpoint to the movie, in the movie. Yeah. Um, Right, girl, then versus now. Um, when Spitboy started in 1990, I don't think Riot Girl existed. Mm-hmm. Or, because the dates aren't totally solid in anybody's head, I don't think. Um, I, I would love to say that Spitboy started before Riot Girl. <laughs> but I don't, I don't know if that's necessarily true. We were probably starting side by side. Yeah. And there was no internet. So we had no knowledge of what was going on up there in Washington, Oregon and Washington. We, we didn't. Um, there was no internet. The only thing you can find out about other scenes is if, when bands were touring or in the scene report Maximum Rock and Roll. Mm-hmm. So um, when Spitboy formed within a few months, maybe six or nine months, um, people started asking if we were a Riot Girl band, and we're like, "What?" And we figured out what it was very quickly. And among us, we were like, "No, we're not a Riot Girl band." But at the time, we were savvy enough um, and thoughtful enough to not want to dismiss Riot Girl. We really didn't want to do that, um, because we knew that. They stood for everything we stood for, and we stood for almost everything they stood for. So we didn't want to, like, speak ill of the movement because that just seemed really terribly counterproductive. Um, But we did not want to be called girls. Women in the Bay Area, I've said this a lot of times, and it's worth repeating, women in the Bay Area in the 1990s, feminists in the Bay Area in the 1990s, did not want to be called girl. That was the opposite of what we wanted to be called. And... We we thought of ourselves as women. We feel we felt like no, feminism. You call we're feminists, and you call us women because you call us girl. You're participating in this hierarchical idea about about women. In spite of the fact that I'm an adult, you're going to call me a girl, and that's hierarchical thinking as far as we we were concerned, and an insult. And um, so right away we discussed it amongst the band and said. We're definitely, well, we're not a Riot Girl band because we're A, we're not, and B, we definitely don't want to be lumped in with them because we don't want to be called girls. Um, as we saw more Riot Girl bands, we liked a lot of them. We liked a lot of the music. We were all a little uncomfortable with the overt sexuality um, of, a lot of, of a lot of the stage performances of the Riot Girl bands. Um, 
we were doing the kind of male hardcore thing. I'll be honest. Our, our aesthetic was stomping around male hardcore aesthetic. But we also were uncomfortable with the sexuality because the majority of us in Spitboy had either been raped or molested as children. And we really did not feel safe being sexual on stage. Because even if someone did something to us and we were being sexual, that wouldn't make it your fault. It just felt like we were making, we would have made ourselves more of a target and just made us really scared and really uncomfortable. So um, occasionally I would, I would play in a sports bra when I was really hot, but normally we wore just baggy clothes, you know, t-shirts, um, jean shorts with leggings. Um, we just kind of dressed kind of like boys, punk boys for the most part. Occasionally we wore dresses and we weren't against wearing dresses. Um, I think we just had very fluid identities, you know, gender identities. And that was a part of what Spitboy was about, like not adhering to any one role. We don't have to be super feminine. We don't have to be super masculine. We can be all of that all the time or different things at different times, depending on what we want, what we feel at that moment. Um, so now I think I basically still feel the same way about Riot Girl mm -hmm. than as I did back then. Mainly because I was just felt so burned. And it was only one riot girl. I shouldn't feel burned by the whole yeah. riot girl movement when one riot girl accused us of cultural appropriation. But the fact of the matter is that one riot girl represented a blind spot in that movement. And that was people of color. And that's truth as far as I'm concerned. She did not see me because people in punk rock tended not to see that I was a person of color. And riot girl which was a mostly white feminist movement at the time, it was a blind spot for them too. It was a blind spot for the whole scene and maybe the Riot Girl that, that it was a blind, for, blind spot for Riot Girl was just kind of an outcropping of a problem from the scene, right? I don't know. Mm -hmm. But what I do know is um, I got burned bad and I'm still angry about it. I'm still angry about it, absolutely. Um, did your bandmates acknowledge, um, I mean, well, because you said that they didn't really talk about it either, um, and your bandmates in Spitboy were white. Yes. So did they acknowledge, like, the ridiculousness of... They were pretty surprised. I mean, they were, I didn't tell them all the complicated feelings that I had, because I didn't really have language for it. Mm -hmm complicated feelings that I was having about not realizing that I hadn't been seen, realizing that nobody saw me the way I saw myself in the scene, including my own bandmates, because because I knew it extended to, the, to them, I couldn't tell them. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't have had the language to tell them either. But we did discuss being accused of cultural appropriation. And, you know, I had come up with the title of the record, and they agreed to it. And they knew I wanted to do it because of my background. That doesn't need to be said to be understood, right? Um, so um, they thought it was pretty a pretty sh shitty situation. And um, frankly, um, it just sort of matched how we felt about the Riot Girl, about yeah. the whole Riot Girl movement. And again, I will reiterate, it was one Riot Girl who accused me of that. But she did put it in a zine and, you know, um, it, it helped me see and helped me realize that um, most people didn't see me the way I saw myself. Mm -hmm. um, so it was probably good that it happened in a way. Um, because I, I, while it was a hard realization, it was a difficult realization to realize that I had participated in my own invisibi invisibility. I um, could now at least do something about it. Yeah. Write songs about it or, you know, live it better or more or whatever wear taupe lipstick which is what <laughs> yeah. i did um <laughs> one of the other chapters that i thought was really interesting it made me laugh but i thought mm -hmm. it was like, really sad too um was the chapter the threat where you're all in the studio you know you were talking about mm -hmm. your aesthetic and the band and kind of dressing like boys and um dressing sort of tough but you all listen back to your vocals and you hate how it sounds because it's too screechy and high pitched. And so on one hand you were feminist and wanted to sound like women, but you also didn't want to sound too much like women. Yeah. Um, I mean, 
I get, you know, I guess like you did it, but how do, how do you feel about it? Like, like looking back on it, would you have done it differently or did it occur to all of you at the time why you went back and re-recorded the vocals and lowered your We knew. Registers? We knew. We didn't want to say it. We didn't it. want to like admit it. To no yourself. one wanted to say it, but we all knew what we had to do, what we felt like we had to do. But I don't think we wanted to admit it. Um, or maybe we were only on the cusp of understanding it. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe barely on the cusp of understanding it. I was so glad. I wrote that chapter later, and I'm so glad I included it um, because it was one of the chapters that I felt embarrassed to write. Yeah. Um, I was mildly embarrassed when I when I admitted that that oh, we. See, I was laughing because I could like identify, <laughs> you know, as like girls in bands. There's right. Always, you always that happens to everybody where you're like, oh, I shouldn't play it this way, or I should sing differently because right. you want to be accepted by right your peers. Yeah. Right. Well, I was pretty, um, I was definitely embarrassed when I wrote it. But then as I was writing, I thought, oh, this is really important and it's really interesting and it's really complex. The whole issue really is complex because nobody wants to be grading, right? Nobody wants to be grading. But what is grading from a female is totally rooted in stereotypes about women and that just sucks i mean how can you pull that how do you separate that and pull it apart i mean you just can't really um so we didn't discuss it more than over the vocal mics as described in the chapter where we're all like is that what we really sound like we want to redo it we don't want to sound like that um and that was as far as we discussed it and we did not say We need to sing it differently. Mm -hmm. We didn't say, everyone lower your voice of register. We just knew. (laughs) We just knew what we had to do. Um, Which is so, it is so funny that we all just sort of like intuitively knew and then just did it. And then we sang our our backing vocals that way for for forever. All of our backing vocals that way. We sang them in a register that would be just a little lower than what we probably normally would have been inclined to do. um, In order to avoid that screechiness. Um, as I say in the chapter, sounding like, um, uh, what is her name? Archie Bunker's wife. Oh, (laughs) and I love that the recording engineer guy (laughs) said, you guys were like, that's what we sound like. And he's just like, yeah, 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 that's what you sound like. He said, you don't want to sound how you, he goes, you don't want to, he actually had a, the funny thing is Kevin is a really sensitive, sensitive guy. And, um, he actually had this little smile on his face, like, you don't want to sound how you sound, because he knew it was ironic yeah. that we felt that way. And that's why I, I thought to write the story was because of his remark. Because at the time, I caught that expression on his face, and I was like, oh. I wouldn't have realized or been on the cusp of realizing what the problem was if he hadn't pointed it out to us. Yeah. And he was gentle enough and kind enough not to mansplain it to us. He wouldn't do that. Um, but um, we figured it out on our own. Yeah. <laughs> he like let us He let us figure it out on our own. <laughs> um, okay, and this is, I'm always just curious about this, but so you're in, you're in like a working, touring band. Mm-hmm. Uh, you were on a few different record labels, Lookout, Allied, and... What was the second one and the third one? That you Ebullition. Had? Yeah, that was your mm-hmm. like, long-term label. Um, but how did you supplement your income or how did you like afford to live during that time? I'm mm-hmm. assuming that you didn't make very much money from the, the band. but um, I was a preschool teacher. So I worked all those years as a preschool teacher. Um, okay. When I left the job, I was making $12 an hour. So, yeah, that's not very much money. Uh, It was a lot less expensive to live here in the Bay Area. Karen um, had a pretty well-paying job working for Mordam Records, which was at the time the punk record distributor Mm -hmm. of of all the the punk labels. And they did really well for themselves. Um, So she was probably the best paid. Um, Adrienne worked at Blondie's Pizza for many, many years. Um, And then she worked, um, like, at Whole Foods. She was, like, a manager. Okay. Um, Paula did a variety of different jobs 
Dominique was a student when Dominique joined. So, and Spitboy is the kind of band that, like, the things that Spitboy did, did as a band and the choices that we made as a band are why women, people think that women should run the world. Mm-hmm. We were very, very organized. And we were very, very, very spendthrift. We did not party very much. We hardly partied. We did not drink before shows. We drank only very little after shows. We did not do drugs. We did not take all the money from each show and divvy it. We didn't even take the money and divvy it out to each person after the show. We saved all our money. Mm-hmm. On t- if we were playing on the weekends in the Bay Area, Karen was like the band secretary. She would take the money we made and she would put it into the Spitboy account. When we were on tour, we paid ourselves first $5 a day and then $10 a day, and then we put the rest away in a fund. And that way, if anything broke down in the van, if anyone needed strings, if anyone needed sticks, we would just use the band money for that. Gas, all of that. Um, when we went to Europe, we um, I think the, the plane tickets were like a whopping $700 round trip. That was like so much money. I don't even, frankly, I don't really even know how I got all that money together. I must have saved for a few months. I must have been really careful. We knew we were going in advance, so I probably saved money. And I'm betting Karen lent me a little bit of money. Was this the Citizen Fish yes. tour that you wrote about? Okay. Mm-hmm. And we were gone for like six weeks, so it was a, it was a long tour. So we said we were going to put up the money ourselves, and then we would pay ourselves back from the money we made on tour, if we made any money. And if we didn't, we would just be out the money and at least we toured Europe, hey, mm-hmm. right? I mean, that's cool. Who gets to go tour yeah. Europe? Um, and get have someone make you dinner every night and give you wine and really good cheese and, like, be excited to see you. Like, you know what, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, okay, if I'm out $700 for that, it's really not so bad. Well, we did so well on that tour and we did such a good job of saving our own money that we came back and I remember what I remember is that we paid ourselves back for the plane tickets and nearly double. Oh wow. So I made the wages that I would have made when I was on the tour. So I didn't really lose money by not working in the end. Because we just paid ourselves out ten dollars a day. Maybe it was five dollars a day. Five or ten dollars a day, including to our road crew. And um, in the end, we paid our road crew out of, the, out of the money that we had kept in our pot. And then whatever we had left, we divvied up among the, amongst the band mm-hmm. to cover wages, lost wages from work. And I made my money back, plus my month's wages, which, yeah. It's I'm, like unheard of. Yeah. <laughs> and some of it is because, um, you know, we, we heard of other bands coming back, you know, with like little to nothing. But... Sometimes that's because the bands want to party or they just divvy the money up every night and then you spend it. And we were like, we're not going to do that. You wrote about that in your book too, (laughs) how people expected you to be kind of like crazy and mean and party a lot and all you really did was play board games. Play Scrabble (laughs) and I like smoke hash once. Yeah. And um, yeah, people expected, you know, people expect bands or rock bands. It's an extension of kind of like the cock rock, party okay. hard bands, right? People expect people in bands to, you know, there's a stereotype about bands that they're going to be wild and they're going to play shows and then go get chicks afterwards. Well, since we're a female band, some of those stereotypes don't apply to us, right? Um, and we we didn't care for partying. In fact... Spitboy feared date rape. We had to be vigilant. Men, maybe men can afford, I mean, it's pretty stupid to go to some, to go to some country overseas and get all wasted and get all Ryan Lochte on everybody and do something stupid and try to blame everybody else. But maybe men can do that and it's not as dangerous, but it's, it's not as safe for women. And, you know, women are always told you have to be aware of your surroundings at all times, blah, 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 protect yourself. Um, Because we feared date rape so much, we did not, you know, it was usually men putting on our shows. It was usually men, a a lot of times we were staying with, with men, not always, but a lot of the times men were putting us up. And we had to be careful, and we knew it. 
And um, I don't know, given the kinds of songs that we were singing about and the kinds of experiences that we had had with assault and molestation as children, and given the reality of the world and violence against women, we um, we just knew that we had to be vigilant, and you can't do that when you're drinking alcohol. So we didn't party a lot. People also thought we were going to be really mean because our songs are so serious and like about feminist issues, and people were really surprised. People always said, you guys are so nice. You're so nice. And we're like, why do they keep telling us that? So, man, we must be really nice. I didn't know I was so nice. I didn't even think I was that nice. But um, especially me because I was the standoffish one. But um, we learned quickly after asking, we asked someone who, who um, we became to like very quickly why people, why she thought people said that to us. And she said, oh, it's because people expect you to be mean because of your lyrics. So, so it's back to that, you know, man-hater stereotype, right? It's an extension of the man-hater or, you know, ball-busting woman. Um, and um, we were kind of, we busted some balls, but we, but, you know, we were, you know, just regular old humans who aren't going to be mean to somebody who they put on a whole show for us yeah. and like let us stay at their house. <laughs> we ha- The other thing about Spitboy, I will say that this is probably true more so than for some other bands, but we also all had really good social skills. Mm-hmm. All of us are pretty extroverted and we're very good communicators and we prided ourselves on being very good communicators um and so i think our social skills also kind of you know exacerbated that that sense that we were so nice yeah um what were well you have some stories in the book about you know hecklers and guys at shows but for the most part um was your audience pretty split like men and women was it mostly men because you were playing a lot of like hardcore shows Mm -hmm. with other Mm male-fronted bands um and overall uh how did your audiences receive you Mm -hmm. definitely the audiences were were more men than women but you know when we toured people the word would get out that sweet boy was all female or they had read about us a maximum rock and roll or something and um women would come up to us after the shows and said, we heard what you were about and we had to come and see it. Um, we were so excited that you were coming to our town. Or So I do think that more women came to shows when we played, which is really cool because yeah. the word got out. Um, and that was really exciting. Um, but it was definitely more men. And, you know, we played because we were an all-female band when – a venue could it seemed like they would try to put women on the bill which was really cool Mm -hmm. um you know they would try to pair us up with another band with at least a couple women in it because it just seemed like the right thing to do you know you're just kind of matching right you know the matching game um but um it was definitely mostly men and almost not every night but most nights there would be some kind of heckler in the crowd yeah um, and that was, you know, dealt with swiftly and loudly and, you know, often given a lecture. And, you know, everyone likes a lecture at a punk show. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we didn't shy away from lecturing, even though we knew then people didn't like being preached to. Um, you know, we just felt like, yeah, okay, it's not going to be fun. I don't really want to lecture you, but I'm also up here on stage in a very vulnerable position and you are going to stand out there in the dark yeah. and harass me. I'm not going to not say something. So that was what it came Do you down have people, to. Like people in the audience stick up for you and things like that would happen too? So Definitely. Just on your shoulders. Or Definitely. Anything? I mean, sometimes some audiences, no one would say anything, but a lot of the times you could see the heads turn like, what? You know, like, um, I don't think anyone ever, I mean, the one time I really remember was in France when um, a guy told us in French to play naked or to, to take off our shirts, to play with our shirts off. And there was a woman in the crowd who was like, hey, hey, hey. And she, she spoke English, French, and Spanish. Um, I think she was Spanish. And um, she said, she said, I wanted to tell you what he just said. And Karen happened to be flu- happens to be fluent in French. And she said, oh, yeah, I, I, I caught that. And then she cussed the guy out in French. Yeah. Um, 
And the whole crowd was shocked. People were like laughing and gasping like, what? They couldn't <laughs> believe it. But that I do remember being just so happy. And we went up to her afterwards. And to her, the woman, I'll never forget her name. Her name was um, Noemi. And um, we went up to her like, thank you so much for, you know, looking out for us and having our backs. So it was really cool. And she's like, those guys are assholes. Um, um, and I like that you had a no boyfriend rule. Yes. On your last tour. Mm-hmm. Um, and that kind of goes along with what you were saying earlier about saving money and really being like a working kind of responsible band. Mm-hmm. So uh, this rule that you instilled, was it because like had you had experience be- experiences before where you were bringing boyfriends or significant other? It wasn't a financial decision. It was a, a band dynamics decision. Oh, okay. We we knew that you know, because Spit Boy got along so well and we were, we were such good communicators and we were so unified that we didn't want to mess with the dynamic. And I had, in Bitch Fight, <laughs> we had our, our singer Susie brought her friend in to play bass. We just taught her all the bass lines. Uh, Chris, we were like, Chris is going to play bass for us. But we kicked her out because she just wanted to smoke pot and, yeah. and hang out with her boyfriend. And um, we just didn't, in, in Bitch Fight, we didn't respect girls who put their boyfriends first. We were like, Ugh. we had like no tolerance for that. Mm-hmm. Like, it's the band first. This is serious business here. It is the band first. And for me, that those early um, you know, experiences and, and values seeped into Spit Boy. So... Um, when we decided on the no spit boy rule, I don't—I mean the no boyfriend rule. I don't know who's who's who actually said it, but I was definitely—it may have been me. I—I I, I don't think so, but um, I was definitely on board with it because um, men changed the dynamic. Yeah, and we also we really wanted to prove to the world and to ourselves that we could do everything. If we brought someone's boyfriend on tour or a man, then we wouldn't know and nobody else would know that we could write our own songs, we could drive our own van, we could play our own instruments, and we could change our own tires. We could manage our own money. And we we needed we wanted to know that we could do that. Um, you know, we definitely come from that, you know, that second wave feminism where, you know, you know, women want to do everything. Damn it, you know, we're gonna do everything. I don't need a man to do anything for me. So um, the, the no boyfriend rule definitely came out of that, those, val- those sets of values. Um, and did you view the band as a sustainable career? Like, did you think that it would last? Or, no. No, I mean, I hoped it would last for a long time, and it lasted um, a really, I mean, five, six years for yeah. a band is a good long time. Um, but it wasn't. A career. Mm-hmm. There were several reasons for that. Spit Boy was a message first. And our message was just, our message and the music that we chose as the vehicle for our message is not mainstream. We didn't want it to be mainstream. That wasn't our aim. We wanted to play the kind of music we wanted to play, and we weren't going to compromise our message to be in the kind of band that you could make a ton of money off of. So we were a message first. Mm -hmm. And we also knew that if we played pop punk or we looked a little more girly and didn't scream as much that we might be a little marketable, especially like after Green Day. Um, broke through the market and and decided to sign. Um, But that was not what we were about. We were about our message and we would have had to compromise that. It wasn't even an issue. It wasn't even, it wasn't even something we talked about. It wasn't, it wasn't, it was just a non-issue. This is who we are. This is what we do. This is how we do it. And we do it in this scene. And that's, that's how we're going to get our message out because there are plenty of young people like us who need to hear it. That's interesting, but, um, because you have that chapter too, um, where or there, I think it's two separate chapters where you talk about 
seeing Nirvana, I think like Bleach era Nirvana, and mm -hmm. then you talk about Never Mind. Kurt, mm -hmm. Yeah, Never Mind and Kurt Cobain's suicide. And you mentioned Green Day mm -hmm. and Nirvana and how people kind of like turned on them and mm -hmm. that whole, you know, uh, selling out. And, mm -hmm. um, but I mean, so that was just never even. It was never even in the back of your minds that, like, if we did anything differently, we could, like, sell more records or make some money or, like, keep doing this. Well, we knew we probably could, but we were never but going to do it. to do it. Okay. And now, I think this goes for just about everybody in Spitboy, but for myself in particular, I grew up with Green Day mm -hmm. in the punk scene. And I was 17 years old when I moved to San Francisco, to the Bay Area. And I met them when I was, like, 18, 17 or 18. And um, they were even younger. And they hung around and went to parties that I went to and played shows that I played. And we were all friends. And so I know that some people are musician musicians. And those people are going to get criticism in the punk scene. Because it's not punk to really be a musician, number one. And it's not punk to sell out. But I know because I played music from the time I was third grade, that some people want to make a living on music, playing music because music is everything to them. And I respect that. I don't have, a, I've never had a problem with that. I was never angry, not one second at Green Day. I wouldn't say I was like over the hill and over and overjoyed for them or anything. I thought, well, this is, it's going to be tricky. Hopefully they make it. Hopefully, you know, they don't get dropped and hope, you know, because being on a major label is, is a lot of, you know, it could be a lot of disappointment. A lot of bands in the scene went through that. You know, they were picked up and then they were dropped and then yeah. the band doesn't survive after that. And that's what I worried the most for them. But some people are musicians in every part of their body. And that's not me. Mm -hmm. And that's not what I was trying to do with Spitboy. But if somebody else wants to do that, I'm not, I, I think, you know, it's still an art form and I still respect it. Um, I understand the whole argument. I've written about this a lot. I understand the whole sellout argument, blah, blah, blah. But Green Day never wrote political songs. They didn't write political songs until they were on a major label, and good for them for doing it. But they always wrote songs about girls back in their day. It's like we're going to get all mad at Green Day for selling out when they weren't like, it's not like they were Econochrist and then they sold out because it wasn't like that. Yeah. They always wrote love songs, <laughs> the kind of songs you'd want to hear on the radio. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Um, okay, and can you talk? But in your book, you mentioned the mm -hmm. punk scene's mm -hmm. excitement over the band and how that was personal validation for you. At first, I was kind of mad. I was like, I'll be honest. At first, I was kind of like, really, really, all these white punk kids are like hella hyped over Los Crudos. How did that happen? Like, I have been invisible. And I wasn't angry at Los Crudos. I was, in, I was angry at the East Bay punk scene. Mm -hmm. I have been invisible for how long? And now everyone's all excited about Los Crudos. Now, of course, we're, we're, we're moving into a later, you know, we're, we're moving into even more widespread discussions about multiculturalism at this point, okay? Um, when they finally came to the Bay Area. So people are getting a little more savvy about those issues. Um. But I also think that some people in the punk scene who had been like, no KKK, no fascist USA all these years felt like Los Crudos was a band that could actually put that slogan into like a real form, mm. you know? And I think that people are smart enough to see that, which is cool. Like, okay, that's a slogan, but this is real life. We have real life. Latino dude singing in Spanish. Yeah. Um, it cracked me up to see a bunch of white kids singing in Spanish when Los Crudos would play. People would be singing along to their lyrics. It tripped me out. It also, and like I said, like I said before, it made me a little mad a couple times too. Not that, you know, I should be mad necessarily, but it just made me mad. Like all, I spent so much time in the Bay Area scene, being invisible and, you know, wishing I spoke Spanish. And now all these white punks kids get to feel like they speak Spanish because they can sing along to some of those crudos lyrics. 
<laughs> I mean, that's maybe a little petty, but um, that's how I felt. Um, on the other hand, I was so relieved when I met them because I just, I just needed them really bad right then. And there they were, came to town, they play some backyard party. They're all like sweaty and gorgeous and brown and <laughs> beautiful. And I just, I just thought, I really thought this, I, I need to have them all to myself. I don't want to share them with anybody. I just want them all for me. And I, so I invited them over. I said, you guys have a place to stay. You can come and stay at my house. <laughs> and I made them food. And um, Martine and I hit it off like just, we hit it off like crazy. We were like cousins, like long lost cousins. We like stayed up talking all night long. And um, we just became really good friends right away. And we knew that we would write each other letters or call each other on the phone afterwards. There was no internet or anything like that. So um, we knew that um, we were meant to be friends and that we would find ways to be together and to collaborate. Um, and then I started dating the guitar player and um, that lasted for about a year, year and a half or something. It was long distance, so um, it wasn't like exclusive or anything like that. Um, it was really an amazing and important relationship for me because I had been dating mostly white guys in the punk scene, which seemed normal to me because all of the guys that were around me were white guys. Who else was I going to date, really? Yeah. You know, it was just a matter. It was a convenient, there was convenience dating, but there was also a little more to it than that. You know, my mom has sworn off Latino guys after my dad because she was just so like shell shocked from having been abused by him. And, um, while I never felt that way about it, I definitely, that rubbed off on me a little bit, that fear. It wasn't really a fear, but just kind of a leeriness of, of Latino men or men of color. Um, it's not that I wouldn't have dated them because I was pretty, you know, I just, I had sex with whoever I wanted. I don't, I don't, I didn't, ha I don't have, you know, I didn't have like um, personal values or let anybody slut shame me or anything like that. If I wanted to have sex with somebody or be in a relationship with somebody, I would do it. And I was a very um, um, sexual young woman who enjoyed being with people. And often they were musicians because when you play an instrument or when you play in a band and you see someone playing in a band, it's just such a visceral thing. You're just like, especially other drummers, you know, for a drummer to watch another drummer, you're like both jealous and hot all at the same time, right? <laughs> you're just like, oh my God, I want to be able to play like that. And damn, you look so good doing it. And it's, and I'm, you know, the physicality of it is so attractive to me. So I dated a lot of drummers and a lot of other people in the scene, but um, the relationship with Jose was really important for my personal identity, my ethnic identity, and it made me, it did make me realize that there was something a little self-hating about um, the choices that I, I made in, in the relationships that I had had. Mm -hmm. um, and looking back on it, there's probably really only one person, and he's written about affectionately in the book, who I really did love. There's really only one white guy that I was really actually in love with. Um, but, um, the other were just kind of like, you know, on the fly relationships or, you know, not super long lasting and not super deep, just kind of relationship you have when you're young, right? When you're trying to figure it out and figure out the kind of person you want to be with. Um, but Jose helped me figure that out in a, in a way that was like much deeper and much more important. Um, but it didn't last. It was a year and a half. It was like a year or something. It was a long distance relationship. I knew the relationship was going to last, even though I wanted it to, um, but it had a huge impact on me and, and my choices in relationships moving forward. And because of my relationship with Jose and because of how obvious a pairing Spitboy and Los Crudos were as a band, we were both hardcore bands that sang about important issues. We were kind of like a brother-sister band. That's how we saw it. Um, we were really um, two peas in a pod in a way, like, we're very forthright in message, very clear on message, and um, super hard, hardcore music. And it just seemed like an obvious thing to do a split record yeah. together. And also because we were all such good friends. You know, Adrian really liked Martine. I mean, everyone likes Martine. Nobody doesn't like Martine. Martine <laughs> is like the most likable guy in the world. 
Um, but we all became very good friends, and then there was the relationship. I was very careful on the, the split record not to name anybody by name and say, oh, thank you to, you know, Jose or whatever, because Spitboy was very uneasy mixing mixing band business with relationships because we were young, but we were smart enough to know that relationships at our age don't last. You put that on a record forever, it's there forever. And then you're going to be like, oh, that was that one minute I was in love with so-and-so on that record. Oh, and then here's this record. I was in love with this guy, right? No. And we didn't want it to be about men. We didn't want it to be about men. So um, we were very careful in that way. But doing the split record with Los Crudos was, you know, really a really fun project. And we did a lot of it on the phone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we had to do a lot of the planning on phone and by, by um, regular mail. Yeah. And or when, you know, meeting in person, um, if someone was on tour, I don't remember how that happened. I think there was one time in the middle where we actually met up with Martine or something because he happened to be out here. Um, but so it was just it was a really nice it was really convenient that Spitboy and Los Crudos were so similar in these ways that were really important to us. Um, and we all became friends and then put out the record. Um and the relationship was just sort of like, just, you know, a, kind of separate from that in a way. But um, it was an important time for me because on that split record, um, I don't know if I wrote it just for the record or if it just happened to come out. It was because of Proposition 187, actually. Um, you know, we live in California and Proposition 187 was a super anti-immigration bill. And um, I wrote a song that was inspired by Proposition 187. But it was a song I probably wouldn't have written had I not been exposed to Los Crudos. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, they definitely helped develop my, you know, my personal relationships as well as my, my um, sense of freedom to write about the issues that are specific to my identity and not anybody else's in the band because I probably wouldn't have done that before as readily just because I just would have felt like it didn't represent the band mm -hmm. and I don't know I just you know yeah. when we were singing mostly women's issues songs for so long you tend to we tended to write songs that represented the band mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and can you just talk a little bit about uh it wasn't like an explosive breakup or anything but you disbanded in 1998 and you got married pretty shortly after that. So in, you know, your book kind of, it's just about spit boy. So if you can talk about that period mm -hmm. and then, you know, married life and sort of mm -hmm. what you did after the band broke up. Um, well, we actually, spit boy disbanded in 1996. And oh. then um, from 1996 to 1997, Karen and Dominique and I were in a band called Instant Girl. Okay. And Instant Girl was just Spit Boy minus Adrian, and we all sang. And we put out one record, and we knew we were only going to be together for a year because Dominique had gotten into Yale to study architecture, and um, she she deferred for a year because mm -hmm. um, she wanted to play music a little longer or something. And then I think that was the reason. And um, so Instant Girl wrote a bunch of songs, played shows in the Bay Area, put out a record. It was recorded by Stephen Albini, and then um, we did a tour. Um, in the in the winter, which was crazy, <laughs> crashed the van. Which just us. Yeah. Oh, okay. it just it was just us, and um, we crashed the van, and we um, co compromised some of our feminist ideals when we made our male roadie um, change or put on put on uh, on snow uh, uh, chains all by himself while we sat in the warm car. <laughs> Wait, that wasn't Pete the roadie, was it? Was no, it, that he was, was gone. Yeah, he okay. was gone. Um, this is just a friend of ours, oh, okay. Chris Ganchoff. He happened to be um, Karen's roommate okay. at the time, and they were kind of romantically linked, but more they were he was just a friend of all of ours. Yeah. Um, so, Instant Girl played its last show on like New Year's Eve, nineteen ninety six, okay. and then we left Dominique on the East Coast so she could start school, and. Um, Karen and I drove the van back from the East Coast. It was from actually from from like um, DC um, to to California, and it was a very difficult drive. Um, clearly, Karen and I were on the skids, um, and that had been happening for for quite a while. And a lot of it had to do with um, with with you know class issues and and me being angry about not being seen and feeling like I hadn't been heard. 
and um, somewhat taking it out on her, but also um, I don't think she handled it too well. I, neither of us handled it very well, and it really it it really caused quite a rift between the two of us. And um, I remember getting out of the van and thinking, I don't think I ever want to see her again. And it was really sad. It was really hard. It was a very difficult drive, and it was a long drive. Um, and so after that, after such a sour ending to Instant Girl, I, I was still friends with Dominique. Dominique is, you know, a little younger and a little more, um, you know, um, a little more open to new things and new ideas. And um, so I knew I'd be friends with Dominique forever, and I was right. We still, we're still friends. And But once Instant Girl had broken up, I could feel myself and the, the, the sour ending I had with Karen. I could feel myself almost instantly pulling away from the scene. I just felt like maybe the scene can't grow as fast as I need it to. I can't sit around and wait for America and the scene to evolve. I can't endure both. I can only do one, and I have to do America. Mm -hmm. I, if I, I can't, you know, expose myself to both and feel this raw about it and angry and unnoticed. Um, I need to just forge out on my own and find my way by myself without the scene and without a band. And... Um, so I, I, I applied for school, and I, I got into Mills right away. And um, before Mills started, I um, met the man that I'm married to now. He's um, a friend of a friend of some friends of mine. They introduced me to him. And um, they said, we have a friend who's old like you are. We want to introduce you to him. And I was like, oh. They didn't speak. Sp they spoke really good English, but they didn't know how to finesse the language yet. Uh -huh. You know, so they just were really blunt. And I'm like, oh, that's very sweet. I don't know if I want to meet some old dude from Mexico <laughs> who probably doesn't want to have a girlfriend who's yeah. slept with a bunch of guys and a, a few women and who used to be in a punk band. I really doubt that guy is for me. I he really, wasn't a musician or anything. No. Just a guy. Just a guy <laughs> who thought I was cute. And I was like, he's not going to want to be with somebody like me. Mm -hmm. And I don't need to be judged by some dude who's going to look at my past and all the things that I did and be all like, what? You know, because you, you don't get to slut shame me. No one gets to slut shame me. I don't, I don't believe in that. And it, it's not even possible to slut shame me. Go ahead and try. So um, they got us together to meet once. I finally agreed to something. And um, we liked each other a lot. Um, but I didn't want to date him because he wasn't my type. And um, he was very persistent, and um, he when he won me over. I was actually dating another guy at the same time, and he was dating another woman. And um, he was trying to not date her, and I was very conflicted about the guy I was dating. He was this Chinese American guy, um, who is who I'm still very fond of, but um, he wouldn't introduce me to his mom because he knew his mom was going to freak out that he was dating a Chicana. And Ines, my husband now, was pursuing me like crazy. I thought, okay, I choose the guy who's ashamed of me enough to not introduce me to his mom <laughs> or date the guy who's really into me, who thinks it's dumb that I'm used to guys who are aloof and don't want to call in three days. Because he said, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard. If you like somebody, you should want to talk to them every single day, and I like you. I was like, wow, that is just some real straight up kind of <laughs> kind of business right there. Maybe maybe I should give this guy a chance. So, um we got married very quickly, a lot for mainly for immigration reasons. Um the, there were some laws that were about to change and um we dated for about 2 or 3 months, knew each other for 3 months and got married. Um oh, wow. Uh, March 27th in 1998 because if we waited until April 1st, we risked him being sent back to Mexico for up to 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, I really think I like this guy. I don't really know for sure where this is going to go, but if I don't marry him now, if I marry him too late, then I won't ever be able to find out. I mean, I could just not marry him, but I was also just sort of angry that he, like, 
this is here and he couldn't go anywhere, you know, and he couldn't go back to his country and hadn't seen his family in a long time. And he's just such a sweet person. I just thought he deserved more than that. So I was like, all right, well, let's just do it and we'll see what happens, you know, like if it doesn't work out, then, you know, you have citizenship and here, pay off this credit card that I, you know, <laughs> bought all these books on. And so he paid off my credit card and um, we got married and he got citizenship and, you know, that was like 18 years ago. So clearly it worked out pretty well and um, he had never been to a punk show before ever no. and i wrote him i wrote about this in the book um the first punk show he went to went to was los crudos and he was mistaken this is the punk scene not coming along fast enough he was mistaken for one of the guys in los crudos once they finished playing some guy came and slapped him on the back and said hey man that was a great show that was embarrassing even to read <gasps> oh good oh good i'm so glad you felt that way i want I, that i rewrote and rewrote that scene many times because i really wanted to capture how awkward and embarrassing it was um and then it, it turned out i, I, I worked it. in a, i worked like in a good punchline. yeah exactly right Ooh. but um that was his first punk show and he's been to a few since and now he like you know out of all his friends he like knows so much about punk and he's like met alice bag he thinks she's amazing oh, yeah. he like he thinks like i think some of his favorite people are like the most like recognized people in punk um are people he knows and like considers friends and he just was like wow they're just like these people are so cool but you know in mexico i think that he was kind of like in his own right like a kind of a miss he wasn't like a punk kid but he was kind of a misfit he was really short and really dark skinned and he liked to dance and um, he was a folkloric dancer and kind of artistic and, you know, sh very shy and very poor. And um, he, he went to college and he couldn't get a job after college. And he just he just came to the United States because he just he just didn't. He's like, I'm never going to maybe I can make it somewhere else. I just don't think I can make it here. And um, but I think that he always was very kind of um, a lot more like politically aware than than probably most people in his family or most people in his town. He's he's pretty like has some really great values and mm -hmm. i learned that early on when we met and i'm like wow yeah this guy is you know this guy's really cool he's really you know he's not punk but he may as yeah. well be <laughs> um so it was like did you ever think that you would get married and have kids <laughs> i mean um you know going from like kind of anarcho feminist mm -hmm. punk I always wanted to have kids. I was a preschool teacher, and I loved children, and I loved child development theory. And, um, you know, that growing up the way I did, learning about child development, it was very healing for me. And um, I loved children and and the all the different stages of being a human and the idea that you can maybe, maybe help raise somebody who wasn't so like strict in their gender roles or mm -hmm. raise a young man who was a feminist. I mean, I just loved the possibility of that. And so I always wanted to be a parent, but I never wanted to get married. I've, I always said I would never get married. My mom, she married twice. And um, after she got married the second time, she said, I'm never going to get married again. And my grandmother said the same thing. She never got married after um, she got married the second time. So there's a long line of, of women in my family who are like, you know, get married. And then they're like, um, yeah, I don't need to do that a second time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I don't need to do it a second time because I'll be married to my husband forever. Um, I somehow feel like I know that we are just like really great together. And it's funny to say that because we I never I never to say I'll be married forever to that guy. is a weird thing to say when I never thought I'd be married. Yeah. But. My husband is very good at just letting me do me and is not possessive or jealous or needy or all up in my grill about anything. I, he, when I'm writing, he stays out of my way. He discourages my son from, you know, from eating up that time that I need to write or to do my um, creative projects. And he's very respectful of those things. And in and, 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 he admires the things I do, which is really sweet. But more importantly than admiration is respecting my space. And, like, I'm not going to give up a guy like that, <laughs> a relationship like that. So, um, but it's weird because I never did want to get married. Um, I married him for very practical reasons. Um, 
I wanted to see where it was going to go, and I wanted him to be able to be a citizen if that's what he wanted. Um, but I did always want to have kids. So when we got married, we knew we would have kids, which was nice. Um, I thought we'd have two, but um, after I had the first one, I was um, in the tenure. I was on the way of getting tenure for this job that I have now. And um, I just didn't see how I could pursue my writing, which, um, you know, once I went back to school after Instant Girl broke up, I started studying English slash creative writing at Mills, and I have a master's degree, a, a bachelor's degree and an MFA in English and creative writing. And so I knew I wanted a quieter life. I didn't want to haul around drums forever, but I wanted to do some kind of art. And I wrote about half the lyrics for Spit Boy. So writing is, you know, is the other thing that I've always done, right? Um, so, oh, I lost my train of thought. Um, well, I think you were talking about, you had your son. Oh, right. Why I didn't have a second child. Yeah. So my husband, um, when, when, well, when my son was three, I wanted to have a second one or I was ready. And when my son was four, I wanted to have a second one. But then by the time he was five, when my husband was ready, I was working really hard trying to get tenure and really wanting to start publishing. And, you know, I was reading a lot of Sylvia Plath and, um... I just realized I don't have to have a second baby. It's always, it's what I thought I wanted. Yeah. But I got married and I didn't want to do that. I always wanted a child and I have one and I'm really happy. And the one thing I don't have is my writing career. And I want that. And so the, probably the most feminist decision I've ever made in my life was to only have one child. And it's a decision I'm very proud of and that I will never regret. I can, I have been able to accomplish a lot because I think there are a lot of women who can go and have two, three kids and still do their art, but I don't think I'm one of them. Um, I think I would have, I would have gotten lost in mothering. I think I could have gotten lost in mothering. Um, I still even though I'm a feminist, I still do most of the cooking and I do the laundry and a lot of the in-house kind of chores. Um, and so, and I work full time yeah. and I'm a writer. I told my husband, I'm not one of those martyr ladies. That's just not me. You knew that when you married me. I thought I wanted two kids. It's been five years. He's he walks, he talks, he's in school, I'm trying to get tenure. I don't want to do it anymore. I changed my mind. And he was kind of taken aback at first. And I, I said, if this is going to be a deal breaker for you, I will reconsider. But you're going to have to do a lot more. Yeah. And you're going to have to get up in the middle of the night and do a lot of that stuff. And I said, is that something you want to do? And he said, no. And I said, all right, then we're just going to have one kid. <laughs> What are your thoughts on the visibility of women in rock history in general? Mm -hmm. Is there still a gender discrepancy? Is gender less of an issue now? Has it changed for better or worse since you were active and playing in Spitboy? Well, I think it's better because I think women, the visibility of women in rock is better because of this whole rash of memoirs that have happened. Mm -hmm which I hope isn't just a passing phase. And, you know, in publishing, you know, it could just be a phase. And, you know, once it's not a phase anymore, then maybe someone's going to lose interest in publishing memoir by women. I hope that doesn't happen. Um, but it turns out a lot of women who rock are pretty good writers, which is really exciting. Um, so, you know, there's always that when, when women gain popularity in... American culture, it does seem to happen in sort of a fad-like way, unfortunately. And you see that in waves in the same way, in a similar way that you see the backlash against feminist movements. Um, so I think right now things may be a little better, and people are taking an interest. Sometimes the interest does come across as, like, spectacle. <laughs> um, I... I do think there's a lot of what I would consider faux feminism out there. Um, 
I think Beyonce is a little faux feminist. I'll be honest. Like more mainstream. I'll be honest. I don't like to. I don't never like to talk bad about people, but I think she's big enough where she can like handle it. She can handle it. (laughs) I'm sorry, Beyonce. I'm sorry, Bay. I'm gonna send this Um, to her, but yeah, I know. Right. Yeah. Um, But she is actually performing an important service. While it's fad-like and sensational. I do think that, you know, given her level of status and the fact that she is rather talented at many things, singing, lyrics, dancing, collaborations, visuals, and marketing, all those things, that she is doing, she is performing something that is sort of an important service, and that is exposing young girls or young women to the idea of feminism or making it cool or making it... Um, making it not, you know, making it so it's not uncool to call yourself a feminist. And um, for that, I thank her. But um, because major label approach to marketing is it's so in that moment and what's cool in that moment, and people are always like trying to, you know, oh, what's the word? It's the thing I hate the most. Um, oh, what's the phrase they use when they remake themselves or like, um, oh, what is that stupid phrase? Uh, <laughs> like reinvent? Yes. Oh, that's it. <laughs> people are always, you know, <laughs> artists are always trying to reinvent themselves. Well, I guess the that major labels like that or like that narrative of reinventing yourselves because it makes somebody seem new again or relevant relevant again or interesting. Um, and it makes anything else that they were doing previous to that in some sense irrelevant. And that's really unfortunate. And that's less a feminist issue than like an American culture problem and like, you know, our lack of... of um, ability to stay focused or care about anything for any length of time. Um, Women in history, women in rock in history, what do I think about that? When I was writing The Spit Boy Rule, as I was finishing editing it and writing the last couple of pieces that I decided to add, I read um, Carrie Brownstein's book, and I read um, Kim Gordon's book, and I had before that I had read um, Viv Albertine's book, which I loved, and yeah, way before that I, I read Patti Smith's um, Just Kids, which totally blew me away. But when Carrie Brownstein, when they announced that Carrie Brownstein's book came out, I, I had this feeling of panic and I realized that if that what I was doing wasn't just writing my memoir but making sure that people didn't forget about Spitboy because Spitboy wasn't a right girl band and right now what people remember about women in rock in the 90s is right girl and we weren't a right girl band and I realized I knew that but once these books started coming out and even if the female performer wasn't a riot girl they would somehow get linked in there in the the press about the book would somehow get linked to riot girl and i realized in that i was going to have to go through the whole book over again reread the whole entire book and add anything i could to make sure that I was also writing this book with an eye to the fact that Spitboy was important in history, even though we weren't a Riot Girl band, um, so that we weren't forgotten. And one of the things I did was the original title of that piece, Not a Riot Girl Band, was The Riot Girl Controversy. And I knew, because I'm savvy enough, I knew that calling it Not a Riot Girl Band would get attention. Yeah. So I, I changed the title. Um, and I added that... Um, that excerpt from the the review from Melody Maker magazine from a, a show we played in London in 1992 about how we were in a riot girl band and why that was good. Um, so 
I think that it's easy to forget about women in rock in bands who were, you know, not mainstream, not on major labels, um, not sexy, not trying to um, use um, sexuality or not using sexuality as performance, um, which somewhat falls into kind of like an expectation of women on stage, right? Um, I think it's easy to forget about um, um, to forget about those bands or to not um, readily remember those bands. Mm-hmm. Um, and Spitboy made a, a lot of difference in a lot of people's lives. Um, I didn't realize that was true until I posted a few of those pieces on my blog and people started writing to me. And that, it was then that I decided I had to write a whole book because people were reaching out to me and telling me how much Spitboy meant to them and where they saw us and these, you know, places that they didn't expect us to see, you know, certain talking about certain lyrics or sending me flyers or photographs online. And um, I realized that because Spitboy was together as long as it was and because we toured as much as we did and released as many records as we did, even though some of them were seven inches, we have a legacy that actually has endured. And I didn't realize that. I didn't talk about being in a band for many, many years because I just thought it would be embarrassing to be another, like, person in my 30s talking about her glory days. Yeah, well, I used to be in a band. You know, like, everyone wants to be in a rock band. Um, I don't want to be that boring adult who goes to like boring adult parties and tries to look cool by talking about the band she used to be in. So I didn't talk about it for a long time. And I really had no idea the kind of legacy that we had left behind. And it wasn't, and it was, it wasn't because we were on a major label and it wasn't because we were like sexy and, you know, dance like Beyonce. It was because we did the work. It was because we toured as much as we did and we talked to people all night long, we did so many interviews, we released so many records, and we went overseas a number of times. It was because we did all of those things. And I will also say we were privileged enough to be a Bay Area band, which Bay Area bands in the 90s got a lot of attention. And so we were lucky that way. But because we did all of those things, um, we have a legacy. And I didn't I didn't realize that. And once I realized it, I, reali- I, re- I realized, and these other books started coming out, how important it was to preserve that legacy. And it was a little uncomfortable being the person to do that. Mm. Not mainly because Spitboy was a unit. We did things together. And so here I was representing this band that was once a unit. And it's always a little uncomfortable to be one person representing a unit, right? I don't ever want to misrepresent anything that happened in the band. And I've been very, it's been very important to me to say that everything that was written in the book was based on my experience, my memories of it. Um, but it was also very important. I, I asked Adrian questions and Karen, and I mean, I asked Adrian and Paula and Dominique questions about things that I remembered to corroborate my memories. And I read my journals and looked at flyers and things like that to, you know, to feel like I did as uh, did due diligence and in, in getting the story correct. But um so it's weird. It's a little weird being the one to preserve the legacy of Spitboy. But um, given the interests of people of color in punk rock right now, um, it worked out well. Um, and um, it's given me a platform. Um, and it's given me the, the um, ability to preserve the legacy of Spitboy, but from an angle that people didn't know about before. So I'm proud to do it. All right. Um, I mean, that, is there anything that I have not asked or is there anything that you wanted to say? Did you want to ask me about my son? Earlier you were going to ask me, but you don't have to. Oh, I just wanted to know oh. if your son liked your band. Like, <laughs> but we like talked about your son right. a little bit, and I was right. like, I don't know if I should talk right. about your son for like 15 minutes, but I just wanted to know your, your son. I watch all of his videos I on love that. Facebook page. Um, I'm actually really into jazz music and I oh, play the cool. saxophone. Oh, cool. Like you, yeah. So I, I always wish I could play Aww. piano, but, um, I just wanted to know if he liked that you were in a hardcore band. I think he <laughs> thinks it's really cool and he gets a lot of cachet from school cause he goes to performing arts high school. Uh, it's a middle school and high school. He started there in middle school and, um, 
he plays piano and he plays jazz. It's very different kind of music, and he's very kind of snooty about it. <laughs> but um, he has a lot of friends who are connected to the punk rock scene at, through Gilman. And um, some of those friends know about Spitboy. He's had a couple oh, no of way. people at his school flip out when they found out that his mom was a drummer of Spitboy. And then they met me, and there were a couple guys who were like, oh, my God, oh, my God. It was so cute. And he was pretty embarrassed. I could tell he, he had the face that was embarrassed and, like, sort of proud, like, half proud, half embarrassed face yeah. that teenagers can, you know, it's funny, and teenagers can have, like, all these faces on all at once, right? But, um... So he gets some cachet out of it, and um, he was in that KQED video in the end playing jazz piano. Um, and I told him, you know, we're going to be forever linked. If you become a very serious musician the way you're headed, um, you're going to be the piano player whose mom was in a punk band. I think you need to know that um, and accept it because he doesn't think I'm a real musician because I don't read charts and um, he, you know, thinks punk is just super basic, which it is. I mean, it is basic. It is basic. <laughs> and I, I'm, you know, trying to explain to him. I don't bother going into a lot yeah. of detail because I think he, in his heart of hearts, he really knows all this stuff that what we're doing is really different than what, her do, what, what he's doing. Um, as a parent, you know, parents always want your, their kids to do something a little better or improve upon something they did. And my son is doing that. And so I'm really, really incredibly proud of him. Um, Didn't you say your grandfather was a my, jazz? Musician? Yeah, so, yeah, so and sort of. I'm also proud of him because my grandfather died in 1996, way before my son was born and in 2001. And somehow, the, the weird thing is my son's due date was my grandfather's birthday. Or no, it was the day before my grandfather's birthday. And I went into labor on the due date and had him, basically, like one day away from my grandfather's birthday. Um, but it's just so ironic that I have this child almost on the same day as my grandfather's birthday. And then he turns out to have this jazz gene. <laughs> what seems like, you know, it just passed through us this ability to be a musician and to play my grandfather played jazz piano and percussion so you know i think i got the percussion from him and just musical interests from him um but it, my my grandfather would trip out if he saw my son playing piano he would be he would be just so so thrilled to see you know my son doing something like that that he had an interest in and loved to do and he got so much joy out of so um it's cool. It's really cool being the mom of a young man who is pretty good feminist already yeah. at 14 and who is such a talented musician and who just, you know, is 14 and cares so passionately about something. And people always say, sometimes I, I will say, like, I didn't care about anything like that when I was 14. But that's not true because by the time I was 15, I was a bitch fight. Mm -hmm. So I did. It just wasn't, you know, reading charts and jazz music. It wasn't something that seemed so, like, grown up. <laughs> um, punk rock is a, a young person's um, subculture. Um, so it doesn't seem like I was doing anything as serious as he was. But I was. Um, and so I, f I feel, like, glad that I've been able to instill in him, like, passion for um, both music and caring about something enough to, like, really devote so much of your time and energy to. Um, but yeah, he's, he's pretty like dismissive, um, you know, in a, in a sort of serious, joking, self-righteous, teenager way. But I think, he, I know he appreciates it. Yeah. And he appreciates being in, in a creative family. I do know that. So. Um, anything, anything else, else I want to say? I, said, I was going to ask you that I didn't actually ask you. <laughs> um, no, no, I haven't. All right, well, thank you so much. Sure. Yeah,